All right. All right. Welcome to Movies at Movie, everybody. And today I have Carmen. How are you, Carmen? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. Go ahead and fully introduce yourself. Tell everybody who you are, where you're from, what you do. Okay. Um, my name is Carmen Rawls, and I'm I was born in born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, but I've lived a number of places in the United States and also abroad. Um, I teach uh, world religions and introduction to the humanities uh, at uh, Perimeter College of Georgia State. And in my work on my master's and starting my first PhD, uh, which was not completed, but I'm about to start again. I also lived in South India and traveled through India. And I, um, my daughter and I lived for six years in Morocco. So um, I had a bit of experience. I also taught on semester at sea, which gave me the opportunity to visit 10 countries on a ship sailing around the world. And I think I've been to a total of 21 countries. Wow. Okay, one's an airport, but I was there six hours and I had a meal, so it counts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I invited you today to speak with us about um, High on the Hog, a documentary on Netflix because of your experience in world travel, in particular your, your time in Africa. Mm -hmm. and, and experience with, with African food and, and your connection to the South. So yes, definitely. Let, let's dig off into this Excellent. documentary. Um, now, now I, I know the parts that a lot of people talked about this being just really emotional for them and the parts that they were bawling on. Mm -hmm. I didn't ball on anything. The parts that, that people were bawling on, I, I, I didn't start crying because mm -hmm. that particular part was his experience. He was physically there. And I think right. that's 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 one of those moments I would have to be there um, mm -hmm. for. Um, but there was one part in, in that first episode where I was like, okay, now if you want to talk about reparations, you got to give me that back. I was, I was pretty much shouting at the screen. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I I think that whole first um that first episode was very powerful. Absolutely, absolutely. Just that, I mean, about, just talking about the the root mm -hmm. of, of where so much of what what was brought here. Mm -hmm. where it all started. Share your right. thoughts with me. Tell me what you thought. Um, I I did watch all of it, and I feel like the first and even the second episode were so powerful in that way because we saw in the first episode where we and our food came from. And then in the second episode, we saw where it landed, like uh, where, uh, for example, in the second episode, they talk about um, the rice in South Carolina, farming in, um, in uh, I guess, parts of Georgia uh, and South Carolina um, that have continued those traditions that were brought uh, from African people kidnapped and brought. But not only did they bring the people, but they brought so much food. Now, I will say that I've never been a fan of okra. I understand it as a thickener and I will eat it in soup. But I was like, at this point, you know, You've convinced me to at least give it another chance um, because I just, it was just so amazing. And so um, I don't even know the word I want to use, but just trying to make that connection. I have always been interested in these aspects of our culture that came with us from, you know, as part of the uh, mid-Atlantic slave trade, but in the last year or so in doing research, and I'm actually, you know, God willing, about to start graduate school with a PhD in history, and just realizing how much of African and African American culture have contributed to not only our lives as Black people in America, but our lives as Americans. And so, yeah, I was, you know, but then again, you know, there's been 
it's never been fair. It's never been awarded, rewarded, acknowledged even. Right. I mean, even little things or what might be conceived as little things. I don't really think they're little, but uh, for example, and I don't know really anybody's name because I'm not a huge TikToker. I I watch a couple of people, but the idea that was like Jimmy Fallon had a young white girl on doing TikTok dances that were definitely created by black artists. Mm-hmm. And they weren't getting paid, and she's getting paid, and she's getting this acknowledgement. But the same thing happens with our food, with our music, um, with our dance, historically. So um, right. I'm just very, very, I've become more interested in seeing those things acknowledged, and not just in the regular world, but also in academia. And that's why I'm trying to get this doctorate, because it's not in the books. It's, right. you know, it's not in the books. It's so sad. I had, I'd taken over a class from a professor who uh, ended up having to leave mid semester. And so I was not familiar with the book that he was using. And when I got it and read through it, I was horrified because there was just a few pages about black people in it. Um, I think three black authors, there was no sense of the history. Uh, the Harlem Renaissance was not in the book. So I was like, this book is trash and we're going to talk about something else. Um, right, right. Exactly. And I just feel like it will never, we will never see our impact unless we push people to see it. And that's one reason why I really like this documentary. Not only for, what the, her name is Stephen Satterfield, I think. Um, mm-hmm. But the woman in the first episode, um, Dr. Harris, who actually wrote the text, High on the Hawk. Right, right. right. And so getting it out there. The the so one young well. lady that um he had with her also um had with him also, uh Carell Vignon, she, she oh, yeah. made a real good point um when she said something to the effect of, you know, she really wants to put out there, she was surprised mm-hmm. as um, a, a French woman mm-hmm. with roots in Africa that, mm-hmm. you know, African cuisine was not more known, but right. we are the trendsetter. Mm-hmm. And so if we don't put it out there, nobody else is going to pick it up. Or so, they'll pick it up and claim it as their own. Well, that's that's yeah. easy when they pick it up. Yeah. Once we start mm-hmm. TikToking it, that's when right. they'll, right? Exactly. Right. And they'll label it as soul food, and then all of a sudden, and now all of a sudden, it, Paula Dean's a millionaire. <laughs> exactly, yes. exactly. And, you mm-hmm. know, yes. like I'm noticing lately how many people all of a sudden are like, "Oh my goodness, I, I want oxtail." And I'm like, mm-hmm. growing up, I remember being being Jamaican. I I, mm-hmm. I know people used to be like, "Ew, you eat oxtail? Ew." Yeah. Yeah, goat, and now it's like, oh, you Jamaican, fix me some curry goat, and it's like, right. I ain't just everybody <laughs> <home." laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very interesting um, that the, you know how, and he talks about this. I think it's maybe the, the maybe the first or second episode, I, maybe the second one, but how what was leftovers from the master's table became the fine cuisine that is now called soul food. And uh, yeah. And and then in a later episode, he talks about Thomas Jefferson's cook, whose name, by the way, in case, well, I don't want to, not really a spoiler, but um, his name was James Hemmings. You know that name sounds familiar, right? He was the older brother of Sally. Mm -hmm. He took him to France to learn how to cook. And um, because he wanted this fine cuisine. And and this is really my point about a lot of what American history says is American history. There is no music made in America outside. I'm leaving aside and, you know, I I want to acknowledge him at some point, but leaving aside the Native Americans, Mm -hmm. there's no music in America that's truly American. Europeans brought their music and their dance. Right. Africans brought theirs, including 
music that became the blues. Uh, the banjo is a African instrument called the banjar. Mm -hmm. um, they brought their dance, including call and response in dance, which became um, uh, square dancing. And then this thing with food, uh, you know, using, I mean, the things that white people during the times of slavery wouldn't eat suddenly are becoming fine cuisine or, or soul food. Uh, and they're trying to claim it and it's not theirs to claim. I'm not saying they can't enjoy it. I can't, I'm not saying they can't cook it. There's a couple of episodes here where they do have white cooks who are cooking things. Um, but they're at least talking about the history of it. Right. And that right. to me, you know, just acknowledge it. Um, mm -hmm. Because they really, America was made on the backs of Africans. Okay. Yes. And America had, took everything, like you were saying, our language um, mm -hmm. being lost. And I'd like to talk more about that too. But yeah, um, that you know, they took so many things without acknowledging that we got this when we kidnapped these people. Yeah. 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 And so well, many well, scholars and politicians are like, you know, we built this country. How? When? What'd you do? <laughs> How'd you do it? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, getting back to that that first episode, um, when they visited, oh, and I, look, I had when I tell you I took notes. Uh huh. I took notes. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but um, when they sat down with, oh, what is his name, uh, Ramald? Oh yes, the artist. Yes. The, oh. the, Mm -hmm. The guy who who does art with the jerry cans, right? Mm -hmm. And towards the what they presented as the end of their visit with him, and he brought out all the food, and he said, "Here, taste this, and taste mm -hmm. some of that, taste some of this." There were a couple of things that stood out yes. about that moment, but that's the moment where I was like, "Okay, if you want to talk about reparations, let's talk about this." That's why uh -huh. I was shouting at the screen, right? Because what he said in that moment was if the people had never been taken away mm -hmm. and enslaved, this is the type of food mm -hmm. they'd be eating. Yes. And even at that moment, Corel was like, look, I'm from Benin mm -hmm. and I'm not even familiar with this food. Right. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and it's like, Give me that back. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Along with the land and the language mm -hmm. and the culture and the religion that you stole. Mm -hmm. Okay. Things that are my birthright. Mm -hmm. Give me that back. Give me exactly. that table. Mm -hmm. Give me the the opportunity to sit and present and have that moment with my people. Give me that back because you robbed me of all of it. Exactly. And the culture behind the food. But something else occurred to me is that they were in almost every part of that, you know, he was eating things, but he's like, you know, it's not very sweet, but it's good. <laughs> it's not very fatty. You know, there were some fried things, but not a lot, but it's good. And then it makes me think about um, the history of African-Americans and diabetes and high cholesterol. And that food is good for the people. And right, we right. have lost even our health being torn away from that food. Right. right. But but that, that's all a part of it. That's mm -hmm. all a part of it. It's yeah. not just about, it, it's, it's not so much the food, it's everything that came with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That came from land. Yes. That would have been passed down from one generation mm -hmm. to the next. Waterways that right. we would have lived near. Mm -hmm. You know, that's food we would have picked from the ground with our own hands, grown in our own backyards. Right. You know, that that's food we would have exchanged with our neighbors. We would mm -hmm. have bartered with our neighbors. Oh, you have some of that? I have some of this. Here, you take this, I'll take that. Mm -hmm. 
yes. you know, that that's a whole experience and lifestyle. Right. And that really shows up in the second episode because they talk to a family that has a big farm in South Carolina. But unfortunately, because of eminent domain, exactly, people, they're kicking people off even now of that right. land. Um, I noticed that um, Carell uh, mentioned that um, he's the artist, right? Yeah. Um, well, he actually said to Stephen, you know, don't say this is you all's home. This is your home too. Mm -hmm. And so I really, you know, when you talk about reparations, um, you know, that really speaks to me, but I don't know how it's going to be possible. I have, I fear that because he also said that the reason they picked these people were that they were the strongest. Right. And so if you take people away, use up their strength, get them addicted to things that are not good for them. And I'm not even just talking about the drugs and, and Richard Nixon, I'm talking about the sugar, the fried foods, the fatty foods without even some kind of balance. Cause I'm not going to say no to some French fries, but, um, right. but those things and you take away their health, then you look at them as a depleted resource and you want to go on to the next thing. And that's, that's something I fear. I worry about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then of course, also people, Europeans and others going into Africa and that's still holding up now. I mean, the Chinese are really working hard in Africa and we need those reparations so that we can rebuild our connection to Africa and kind of maybe find ourselves there and stop some of the corruption and I don't know. It's a big dream. But yeah. Yeah. It's a big dream, but yeah. Yeah. But but that very first episode was a really powerful one. And you speak about the second the second episode where where um it got into that that thing with, with the eminent domain, it's mm -hmm. like even that, mm -hmm. you know, just the relevance of that. It's not just happening there. That's everywhere. Right. You know. it, it's especially heartbreaking in the, the Gullah Geechee community. Oh, yeah. What they're doing all over mm -hmm. that community. For so long, they left that alone. Right, right. And those and, people were free to just very quietly live their life. But now mm -hmm. all of a sudden, that's what was shown in the documentary is just one small part of it. Mm -hmm. Now what's what's happened, and I heard about this a few years ago, what um, they've done in, in certain areas of that community, they've said, well, wait a minute, these people are living off well water. Mm-hmm. You mean they pay no no kind of municipal tax or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't have that. We need to force them to get plumbing. Right. So that they have to pay taxes. And based on that, that's how they're trying to uproot that community. People right. that have lived there since slavery, families mm -hmm. that have lived there since slavery, that's how they're trying to root them out of their communities. And, right. and to Gabriel's point, the young lady whose family that's mm -hmm. being uprooted, yes, she said, this is, this is what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This is how they're uprooting. This was land that was worthless to them. And after we have planted and made it we, it's flourishing. We have mm -hmm. gardens. We're feeding ourselves and mm -hmm. feeding communities. Yes, it's fruitful. Mm -hmm. Now they want to raise it. Right, right, and it's it's unfair. Don't they get tired of just being so wrong, <laughs> so criminal? Um, I just it's, you know it's really quite shocking to me how easy it is to just be like, okay, well, how can we tax you out of the land? And for what? Another golf course? You know, it's just... It's always, it's always about the money. Mm -hmm. It's always yes. about the money. We're always a commodity, unfortunately. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yes. Um, the, the interesting part 
there were a number of interesting parts. The history mm -hmm. is always interesting, right? To me, the food is interesting, and and there there were when they got to the part where they were talking about um, the oysters. Oh yeah, it it took me to another documentary. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if you saw the one with Samuel Jackson, enslaved. No. Put that one on your list. Okay. Okay. Probably Everybody put that, that one on your list. You must see that one. That's mm -hmm. on Epics. Okay. Okay. So if you don't have Epics, don't panic. The next time they have that free week, mm -hmm. make jump on it like a hobo on a ham sandwich. <laughs> okay. <laughs> make sure that is the thing that you watch mm -hmm. because when they were talking about how in, in New York that oh well you know some of the streets are paved with the oyster shells and the buildings mm -hmm. and blah 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 there's mm -hmm. a, a part in um the enslaved documentaries where and I forget what what part of what island it was mm -hmm. and he talks about when uh the people the black people were collected and being moved from one place to another. They were taken to this island. Mm -hmm. And to look at it, you would think it's stone oh. where, where the people were kept until they were put on the ship and mm -hmm. taken to the next place, next holding place. But no, it's oyster shells. Wow. It, it's all oyster shells. And while they were being held there, they had no food. Mm. And so there, there were oysters and they were eating the oysters and leaving the shells behind. And that's part of what was stacked up there. Wow. Okay. Definitely going to, going to have to yeah. see that. Yeah. And I forgot what episode, that's like episode three or four, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it just, kind of, that just kind of clicked in yeah. my brain mm -hmm. when, when that was, was mentioned, but even growing up in New York, I didn't know about that part of our history, our connection yeah. to seafood. Being mm -hmm. growing up Caribbean, I understood. Okay, we 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 live near water to survive, and mm -hmm. so it wasn't unusual to have fish for breakfast. Right. We grew up having salted cod for mm -hmm. breakfast. Ackee and saltfish wasn't a big deal yeah. for breakfast. The savory breakfast wasn't unusual, mm -hmm. you know? So, but hearing, wait, oysters? We we ate oysters to <laughs> this point when he was like, you know, people think oysters and things like that aren't for us. We'll eat shrimp and crab and right. <laughs> you know, lobster all day long, but oysters, I still haven't had one. I haven't either. And it's a texture. I have that same thing in my head, right? You know, yeah. it's kind of slimy and you have to, little. but I've eaten snail. So I don't know why I can't eat oyster because I, um, when I lived in Morocco, mm -hmm. you see, you know, you go down the street and there's a guy with a big vat of snails in broth and everybody says, oh, the, the broth is so good, especially if you have cramps or any kind of like feminine, um, uh, like pain or anxiety or whatever. So, um, yeah, I would, I would eat. Really? Uh, yeah. Yeah, this was, you know, sort of the legend behind it. And then so you get them and you eat the um, the snail and drink the broth. So I suppose I could eat an oyster. We have to make a plan to go oyster shucking sometimes. Yes. That, that uh, still stuck on the texture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, wait, you want me to eat a what? <laughs> Those things that have been, yeah, no, you mean things yeah. I pour salt on to get rid of? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. We usually do that with slugs, right? Because they have no shell. But the snail, at least, it's yeah. in the shell. I'm still, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have to it's watch actually tasty. Yeah. Really? Yeah. What do they yeah. taste like? A little bit oceany. Um, <laughs> And uh, and the the broth that they make with it, you know, they just add a whole lot of seasoning to it, and it's uh, I don't even know how to describe it. It still has that sort of oceany taste, but with a lot of spices. Really good. Okay. Really good. That's a new one on me. <laughs> yeah. 
All right. I didn't think I was going to be able to do it, but then once I did it, I was like, this is not bad at all, you know? And you only get like, you know, six or seven, you don't eat it like a whole bowl of it. So. I would never, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. It was good. But I also, I mean, I've had um, camel meat before when I was in Morocco, so didn't think I'd ever, I didn't even know what it was. It was a hamburger, but it was a little bit gamey, but also like really spicy. Okay. And um, so that's one of the traditions that I enjoyed there. Um, and, you know, Morocco is a mixture of uh, people of uh, the uh, Tamazia or Amazia or Berber, um, mm -hmm. which is really sort of an insulting term, but I guess it's more easily recognizable. And then there's French, along a little bit of Spanish, and along with, of course, the Arab people that invaded that area from um, okay. so you get like a really good mix there so do me a favor mm -hmm. <clears throat> do me a small favor sure. because some of our friends may not realize that morocco is not in the middle east can you explain all more? right so morocco is um an african country it's in west africa it is above um the sahara parts of it extend into the sahara it's a little bit political but um it is uh, right on the edge of Africa. And so you can actually stand at the Rock of Gibraltar, which is actually an Arab name, um, Jibal al Tariq, um, which means the mountain of Tariq, um, and look into Spain. Um, and, but yeah, it's an African country. And so, like that portion of North Africa, you have. Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia uh, is really a mixture of cultures. Like I said, there are uh, the indigenous people there and you have the French and the Spanish who of course invaded along with Arab people who uh, been there you know, for centuries, so yeah. Okay. So it's an interesting mix. Okay. And it's a nice, it's a really nice, country, the food is really good, and there is that mix still of the indigenous food and Arab-based food or the Berber-based uh, food. So yeah, good place. I just wanted to make that distinction because what, over here, mm -hmm. since I know you've been over there, over right. here it's always talked about as Middle Eastern, and it's like, I'm like, okay. Well, it I don't think it's politically Eastern. Middle Eastern. Because the king of Morocco, uh, it is said, descends from Prophet Muhammad, mm -hmm. and so and and the same with uh, the other countries in that region. So it's politically Middle Eastern, but it's definitely Africa. Um, right. And you know, I guess the biggest questions happen with with Egypt and maybe really basically with Egypt. But my um, is Africa, Africa, but, right, yeah. it is Africa. It is. <laughs> Geographically, Africa. It is firmly also attacked. again politically Middle Eastern, but they're all connected, right? You know, we know about the whole Afro Eurasia thing. Um, mm -hmm. But I was uh, my uh, ex husband, my daughter's father is Egyptian, and he's he and his whole family are like, oh yeah, we we're from Africa. Um, they were not raised to have any sort of shame about that. Um, mm -hmm. But that's a whole nother political discussion because some people oh, have been raised with that. So, yeah. Yeah. but for example, Berber people, you can find them from white skin with blue eyes to really dark skin, darker than me. And they're like, where are you from? I'm like Atlanta. Um, so, um, and often times people say, but where in Africa are you from? And I was like, you know, <laughs> I don't really know. Now that I've had my 23 and me done, I kind of know more. So I want to know more, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So Hercules. Oh. Yes. Yes. That was interesting. And, and it, it puts in perspective again, you know, how we tell our history, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how we praise our leaders. Yes. And um, balance their humanity or don't balance mm -hmm. their humanity. Mm -hmm. um, because Washington was like, oh, no, you can't stay in, 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 in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. 
Because I think you're trying to run away. Mm -hmm. Five months is your limit. Uh -huh. <laughs> you got to come back. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. But he was so angry. Washington was so angry. But at the idea, at the idea that this man might try to escape, that not only did he bring him back, but he put him in the fields, even though this man's cuisine. And he wasn't trained in France like uh, Jefferson's cook or anything like that. Right. He was cooking how he learned to cook from other Black people. And the mm -hmm. dishes he was making were essentially the food of Black people. And renowned yeah. by the friends of the first president. And he was so angry at this man. Washington was so angry at Hercules. He put him in the field, which was a mistake. <laughs> so, well. this, oh, you made it so easy for me. <laughs> look, this wasn't the only one that he spent time chasing down. As a matter of fact, I think his after Washington's death, mm -hmm. his wife was still chasing down, I can't remember her name, mm -hmm. was chasing down another slave who did the same thing. You mean Martha Washington? Uh-huh. Was chasing down another, another, oh, another, a woman. another okay, a, a woman. woman, okay, okay. It, as soon as I find her name, I'll research it after the show. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll I'll make sure I leave it in the comments. But Hercules was not the only one who was like, I'm blowing this popsicle stand. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I don't Absolutely. know, the two of them may have left together. But yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, yeah. it was not the first situation. So, you know, when people are like, oh, are we going to change the name of our capital? Well, maybe we should. We should, because, you know, he was out here hunting down these people that he paid for right. when they decided they had enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, you know, at the same time, as it was pointed out um, in the documentary, Martha Washington had all these recipes. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but how much time did she really life. spend in the kitchen? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, so I, that was quite fascinating. And I feel mm -hmm. like I, I always have questions about cancel culture. There's some things I'm just like, ugh, I can't even, I can't even talk about you. I can't think about you or I'll get angry. <laughs> right. Washington was a superb general and apparently a decent president for those he represented. It's not <laughs> us, right? But I just think we need to start telling more truths in school. You know, I grew up with the cast album of 1776. Have you ever heard of that? Mm -hmm. So it's a, a play uh, and it's a musical basically about the writing of the Declaration of Independence. I swear my sisters and I mm -hmm. know the words to every song in that musical. Mm -hmm. And it's very funny and it's very entertaining. There are some dark points in it where they talk about slavery and they talk about war. And, um, but for years I was like, oh, you know, all of the founding fathers were really decent guys. And then later on you hear Jefferson have, had slaves. And then later on you hear about Sally Hemings. And then later on you hear about really how terrible he was. Right. Right. In many instances, same with Washington. And so now I'm like, you know, I don't know. I, my thing is knowing the good things that they did and the good perspectives that they had and then the horrible things that they did and those horrible perspectives, I guess they were in line with their times in a sense. Mm -hmm. And so just to ignore their contribution, I think, would be fruitless. But, you know, we also have to put them up against, for example, um, uh, John Adams, who never owned a slave in his life and fought against slavery and was an ab abolitionist. And Benjamin Franklin, who, although he was a little strange, walking around naked because he liked <laughs> air baths, you know, also was not a slave owner. Um, <laughs> you know, so... I think, I think one interesting thing, thing that just occurred to me, though, is that even though these people were from different sides of the aisle in terms of that issue, they still were able to have conversations and work together, which we're not seeing so much in this day. Right. Right. And I wonder. 
I don't know if they all believe in science. (laughs) My my thing is, I don't know if it was necessarily any less contentious back then than it is now. Yeah, well, we know Hamilton was. (laughs) I'm I'm sure folks drew some muskets back then. Um, (laughs) But I mean, Hamilton was killed in a duel. So, yeah. And his son was too. Right. So, yeah. There you go. But But I think, I think, I think we, we, owe it to ourselves to acknowledge the whole story. Mm -hmm. Acknowledge the whole story. What harm is there in saying, yeah, he ran the nation and he also owned slaves. Right. What harm is there in saying, yeah, he, he owned slaves and he, he had someone that was cooking food that, decided they didn't want to be there anymore. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should question why. Mm-hmm. What harm is there in questioning the history? Because well, the only thing that can happen is, I don't know, maybe we might learn something from it. So we don't yeah. have to I mean, yeah. we we'll learn something from it, engage in some critical thinking. But this is why we're having problems with the idea of critical race theory being taught in schools. Because then people are afraid that they're going to be told that you and your descendants <laughs> have really just harmed people continuously, as opposed to listening to it and saying, okay, then let's stop the harm. Um, oh, my God. Um, Heaven forbid. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, my grandfather, my father's father was a very handsome Terrible husband, terrible father. Mm-hmm. I'm not carrying that. Around. I know the stories, and I'm not carrying that around as if that's my legacy. Right. Um, right. My grandmother was wonderful, and you know, I had great aunts and uncles. And, you know, people I've heard about because I was. I, my dad turned fifty two months after I was born, so and he was the second youngest in his family. So you know, I had to hear stories about a lot of them, but. Um, you know, the legacy that my dad got out of his dad being so terrible was, I'm going to be a good husband and a good father. And he really was. And he mm-hmm. that man lived with six women. And there were no sons in my family. So, And he was just, to me and my sisters and all of our friends, just famous for his good cooking and his stories. And because he wanted to be so much better than what, he came from in that case. And I don't understand why in terms of the larger society, people can't make that decision. Yeah. 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 Shame. Shame. Mm -hmm. Shame. And which brings me to Hemings, Mm -hmm. you know, when you have to balance it all out. And, and I noticed that um, his descendant didn't really speak on it. And I, and I wondered what her true feelings were. You mean about, um, the James the or, or, or uh, about uh, James Sarah. Holmes. Um, mm-hmm. and I guess because she, she, um, I guess is an employee of Mont- Monticello, she probably mm-hmm. couldn't say too much. That's probably true. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, they were talking about the legacy of macaroni and cheese, right? You know, and uh, James Hemings, in order to negotiate for his freedom, mm-hmm. had to train somebody else, train another slave right. to continue to cook mm-hmm. for Jefferson. Right. And so he trained his brother. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, ah. Oh. I mean, that hit me in my gut. That if there was really, a yeah. point where I got emotional, mm-hmm. that was it. I, because I was like, thinking about that. But I'm also was, thinking. It, it's like, if anything, I would want to find a way to get my brother out, not find a way to keep my brother there. I understand that. But I don't know if he had that much power, but he might have raised his brother's level at least from maybe the fields or farmhand into the house where he would have at least more respect. 
at mm -hmm. least more, probably more freedom because of that. You know, um, not free, but at least having more freedom uh, yeah. because of that. He, you know, it could have been a, and then maybe he was hoping his brother would be able to make that same opportunity happen later on in his life once he'd been established as a cook. And the thing is, you know, so many records and everything, we, we don't really know what happened to these people, right? Well, so, I, I, if, I, if, I, if I heard it correctly, mm -hmm. he got his freedom and then later Jefferson heard that he drank himself right. to death. Right. So I, I think he harbored some guilt about it. Yeah. If yeah. Not dying dying of natural causes. He he mm -hmm. just didn't handle his freedom well. Right. Right. But it's like okay. I mean I know he cooked, he continued to, to cook. Right. Um but yeah, he didn't yeah. So I mean it definitely could have been guilt and or maybe just trying to live like the Nouveau Riche and getting attached to the drink, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, but I'm really hoping that it was a step up for his brother, at least. I hope. I hope. But that was just like, oh, mm -hmm. you got your freedom, but did you? Mm -hmm. Did you? Yeah, and I'm sure he must have thought the same about Sally, and especially as she was having more and more children by Jefferson and being kept in the house. That must have been horrible, too, you know? Yeah. yeah. I just not to know what that. Jefferson's wife thought of that whole thing. I mean, what did any wife back then think about their husband's mm -hmm. activity? Think about Lincoln. How many little brown Lincolns were running around? Well, it's Lincoln's Washington and Jefferson. I mean, I don't know any black people. I mean, I don't know any white people with those last names. <laughs> I don't, oh, my land. It surprises me. I'm like, yeah, everybody I know whose last name is Washington, Jefferson, or Lincoln is <laughs> Point. <laughs> oh, yeah. Definitely so. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah. So yeah. what about some, some other foods uh, of, of the culture? I mean, we got mac and cheese. We got mm -hmm. gumbo. Catfish. I haven't had catfish. I had catfish earlier in life. I really, you know... I, I don't know why. I have this like weird thing. I'm not so much worried about textures of foods, but I just want to know where it came from or what it did while it was alive. So <laughs> I still eat shrimp, even though I realize that shrimp, lobster, all of those things really are the cockroaches of the ocean. Right? Yeah. Um, catfish is too. Mm -hmm. So I haven't, I mean, and I would eat catfish. One thing I probably had a couple of times and then I was like, but I don't know enough about this, is tilapia. Mm -hmm. And he was, uh, in the first episode, they were talking about raising uh, and, and catching tilapia. And I was like, yeah. that fish is Asian. So it didn't start out there. Mm -hmm. um, and that, so, that was when, when he said, oh, we're going to go get tilapia. I'm like, mm -hmm. I was like, because my dad never cooked tilapia. My dad was an excellent cook, and he never cooked. We, I never heard of that in Sway. I'm like, mm, these are mysteries. Issues. I was like, I'm that mm -hmm. I was like, I'm expecting to hear something real that I've never heard before in any waters anywhere. And he says tilapia, and I'm like, that's not exciting. No, <laughs> <laughs> no. I was like, okay, but we'll go with it. And he said it tasted really good, but like I said, I know it's like that and suede, they're Asian fishes and, you know, I guess they've been released into that area, but, you know, like I know suede is actually a kind of shark, like a little shark thing. Really? So I'm wondering if it doesn't actually, if it's not an invasive species. And so why would you drop it off in a you know place in Africa? I don't know. I, I just don't always trust all that, you know? Yeah, um, see, see, with catfish, the name just bothers me. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen one. I'm like, cat. 
fit. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to leave it alone. Mm -hmm. so. like, here's another thing. I will eat whiting, but I don't mm -hmm. ever remember anybody saying, well, I'm going out there. What is whiting? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to catch some whiting. Never heard it. I know what tuna is. I know salmon. I you know, my daughter and I were talking about this the other day. So mm -hmm. my one of my favorite um, Jamaican dishes growing up has been stew peas and rice. Mm -hmm. Okay. And for those who don't know and who are thinking stew peas as ill, you would eat green stewed green peas. Mm -hmm. Why? No, 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 no. It's stewed kidney beans. Okay. And rice, mm -hmm. and usually there's some cornmeal dumplings, and um, for my other Caribbean friends, they call them spinners because they're you you kind of do this, and they're uh -huh. kind of about that long, and you throw them, and they're real good, and they're dense, mm -hmm. and you bite into them, and they kind of pop. It, it's oh, nice. It's an experience. So that was my favorite dish. Oddly mm -hmm. enough, I won't just eat rice and peas, which is pretty much the same thing, but it's the drier version, red beans mm -hmm. and rice. Uh-huh. Yeah. I won't eat that. Why? Wow. It, it's just, I can't do the drier version of it. Oh, okay. It, it doesn't satisfy me. I need the, I need the stewiness. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So my daughter and I were talking the other day and, and Every now and then she'll order from Popeyes and we were talking about the things that we'll get at Popeyes. And I was like, you know, a small piece of chicken, mm -hmm. biscuits, that'll make me happy. And hey, I'll get some of their red beans and rice. Because it is more Because stewy. it's kind of stewy. Mm -hmm. that, that's mm -hmm. about as close to uh, stew peas and rice as American rice and peas gets. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I so when you start talking about the similarities in, in the food mm -hmm. culturally, uh, right? you know, there, there were things that I was seeing and hearing that I was like, that's familiar. Mm -hmm. That's, that's kind of familiar. Oh, I've seen that before. Right. That that's kind of similar, mm -hmm. you know, like I didn't grow up eating Kalalu, but you know, that's something my mom used to make. And, right. eat and then look over her shoulder at me and go, oh, you too American. You can't have this. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. Yeah. I had yeah. Collard greens day before yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and I like collards. Yes. Me, my daughter likes turnips. I don't mm -hmm. really like turnips, but when they were eating that combination of, I think it was collards, turnips, dandelion and something else. And I was like, I could try that. Mm -hmm. I could try that mixture of greens because my dad had a huge garden when we were growing up and he used to grow all kinds of greens. And, you know, we, we all, we had, we always had too much. We were giving food away to neighbors, um, which kind of goes back to that second episode and just the, the idea of building community around food. Right. And, um, you know, it just reminds me again of how people have been priced out of, that sense of community. I mean, we did have a big old barbecue restaurant right up the street from us where they you know, cook a whole pig or whatever. And But now that's become a, I think it's a McDonald's now or something like that. You know, a, there's a McDonald's and a Burger King that have sort of moved out the more traditional home style restaurants that were in the neighborhood where I grew up in Atlanta, so. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things I would like to see, mm -hmm. I think I'd like to see them finish this out. Well, I did. Long. I feel like there's going to be a second season. I hope so. I feel like I read that somewhere. I hope so. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, to, to just stop with the African influence on food in the United States would be mm -hmm. a shame because it goes so much further into even South American and as I've alluded to Caribbean food. Oh, definitely. 
definitely. And I would love to see see them explore and bring that mm -hmm. back around as well. Yes. Yeah, I think that would be really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And again, a chance to show that the things we have here at growing up in America have roots somewhere else that are some maybe European. Okay, we learn how to make macaroni and cheese from the French. Fine, but we just make it fat. We don't put raisins in it. <laughs> but um, yeah, just to 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 see that America is multicultural in its culture, in its whole culture. Um, and I remembered something I was thinking of before where we were talking about Jefferson and uh, Washington and thinking about the, all the statues and then, which always makes me think of the Confederate statues or as my niece calls them, the participation trophies. <laughs> um, but I feel like, you know, if people would just tell the truth about all of these things again, we could see how important and rich the country is because of all of its contributions instead of holding up some people who really didn't do much more than orate about freedom but not really practice it. Right. 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 And then we can talk about, yeah, you know, you listen to that whole speech, but then you sit down and you eat your dinner. What are you having? Uh, fried chicken, collard greens, cabbage, or whatever. And it is, it is uh, from somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would love to see all of those different elements, like you said, um, the Caribbean and um, Latino contributions to the, the diet be great. Yeah, yeah, and, and to hear the history, the people mm -hmm. that can, that contributed because I, I'd love to see those faces and hear those names. Yes, as well, because again, thinking back to that first episode in that table, mm -hmm. that one dish with the the fermented corn. Oh yeah, I looked yeah. at that and I was like, that looked like an enchilada. Mm hmm. And immediately I was like, okay, how did that end up way over there? Mm -hmm. Is where my head went. Absolutely. Yeah. Out, you know? yeah. So how do we travel around the globe? I mean, and we I, know how, I know how yeah. we ended up traveling over mm -hmm. there, but let's talk about how that food evolved. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm looking forward to seeing that that conversation continue. So yeah, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. Today. Thank you. I really enjoyed it, and I enjoyed I, I, it was a great talk. And yeah, I'm actually going to watch the series again because I need to take notes for my own research. Um, because it's just another element I want to add in. Oh yeah, um, and. and yeah. And I think that combined with your, your own world travels and experiences is just absolutely valuable. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So thank you. We must do this again, hopefully with another movie. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. All right. Well, everybody, make sure that you uh, like and subscribe the page. Feel free to share the link with friends. Join our Facebook group, Movies That Move We Over. Yeah, I did say Facebook. Join us on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Follow us on Clubhouse, also Movies That Move We, so that you always know what the next movie is that we will be discussing. And we will see you next time. So until then, see you later. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.